So my name is Abbas Abayomi Tijani from Adua Hawaii. My dad's from Adua Hawaii. My mom is from Ileife. Adua Hawaii, you're more laughing in all your states. Tell your friends, tell your enemies. I'm DJ Abbas, live in West Fritz, Stratford with my G, Rugged D Baba. And I'm here just to say a bit about what I do and perhaps talk a bit about what he does as well, why he's in the UK. And we're going to have a great time doing that. Great vibe. Peace. Okay, I've been in the UK since 1991. Um, that's a few decades now. And ever since um, my sojourn to this side of the world, music has been my thing. As a DJ, as a broadcaster, and um, a lot of stuff within the community as well. I love what I do, and I think what I do loves me. At the time when we, we, we can almost say that we were the first generation of the Jackpas, but coming to the UK at the time was not about Jackpa. I just finished university. I worked for a year with The Guardian as a journalist, and quite a few of my friends um, who had the opportunity to travel were, you know, decided to go and see the world. I had friends that went to Canada, friends that went to the United Kingdom, the UK, and friends that went to the States. I was 23 when I left Nigeria, and I just felt I wanted to see the world. And um, a few decades later, we're still here, and um, I've loved every second of it. Every second of it. Why DJing? Um, that's a skill I've always had back home in Nigeria. I was campus DJ for my university. And um, coming over to the UK, you suddenly just realize that some of the talents you have come in much handy. Would I have been a DJ in Nigeria? I do not know. I don't know. But I'm um, obviously coming to the UK afforded me the opportunity to now pick up a skill I had. And it was at a time when the Nigerian community was a developing one in terms of numbers. So there were not too many DJs about. So there was a ready audience for me and started DJing for private parties and that moved into nightclubs and uh, that moved into me being a promoter and um, a, about a decade right after that I became a household name in the UK and uh, the beauty of it as well as everything I was doing in the UK my family and Nigerians back home were getting a whiff of that as well so that's why I went into DJ. Oh back in Nigeria back in the days there were um, Top DJs like Colabai, Prince 2000, Silver Ofogu. Um, oh God, the name suddenly, the name suddenly disappeared. But there's so, so many of them. And in the UK, we have the likes of Jimmy the Ballhead, the I, DJ Casey, Omar White, um, Sholabi, and a host of others. DJ whatever. Work, work. We have a very very healthy community of Nigerian DJs in the UK. And even in the association, probably over, over 300 right now, but at large, thousands. And I mean that when I say thousands of Nigerian DJs in the UK. <laughs> DJ Cash, the flash, the famous star tables. Up, 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 oh yeah. What I miss about Nigeria in total is the vibe. Because technically, I describe London as the 37th state of Nigeria. There is nothing you want as a Nigerian in the UK you won't find. But we are diasporans, we live abroad. And the Nigerian vibe is different back home. And that's what takes me back home quite regularly. The beauty of what I do as well is it keeps me in contact with all the major players in the movie and the music industry in Nigeria. So it's really two for the price of one. So I miss Nigeria. I have my Niger, I miss Niger moments. But Nigeria is just six hours from here. If we jump on a bus from Lagos to go to Abuja, I would have flown down to Nigeria and back before you get to Abuja. That's how close we are to Nigeria right now. 
<laughs> um, financially, well, I think it's down to the individual. There are many DJs in Nigeria who are doing massively well financially. And perhaps what makes a difference for some of us here is we're full-time DJs. This is what I do for a living. It's one of my income streams. I'm not a part-time DJ. So yes, um, anything you choose to become your full-time vocation, at least you work towards earning very well from it. Um, well, we've come a long way. We've come a very, very long way in the UK. And sadly, you do have um, that percentage or group of people that come into the UK or go to the diaspora and they decide to toe the wrong line. And it was something we had to deal with. It really didn't matter to me because I had a job and that was basically what I was dealing with. But then during that era, the whole 419 thing kind of like blew out of proportion because people that do this are just a fraction of hard-working Nigerians that live in the UK. But technology has improved and you find out that so many, many people right now, those who did it then, have found out that it wasn't the way, particularly in the system that, that where there are consequences for actions. So if you're caught doing that, you could end up in jail for the next 10 years in the UK. Really, you don't want that. So it's, a new, it's, a, it's an old narrative. The new Nigerian narrative in the UK is a positive one of people who are making things happen. Pick any sphere of human endeavor in the UK. Nigerians are there doing well. Over 300 Nigerian restaurants just in London alone. Loads and loads of businesses. And part of, that you, part of the success is you've been cataloging with this podcast you're doing right now. So it's, that, that era is in the past right now. We're talking about new Nigeria and the diaspora doing very well. Yeah, there was this Nigerian journalist in a very popular soft cell magazine in Nigeria back then who actually came to the UK and on his, re on his return to Nigeria did a news report where he said that 90% of Nigerians living in London oh, we're, we're fraudsters and I'm like <laughs> I did hear you. sorry I was doing an interview new. as I was saying in Nigeria my fans near <laughs> So, um, and there was this Nigerian journalist who went, well, I, I don't even want to call him a journalist, you know. There was this reporter for a soft cell Nigerian magazine back in the day who went back to Nigeria and his headline screamed 90% of Nigerians in London are fraudsters. And I'm like, how did you come by that stats? Where did you stay when you were in London? Who were the people you were living with? What were they doing? And you won on the basis of that from such a, you know, and then I went to Nigeria a few months later and I saw him and I remember pulling me on my side and I said, Mr. Man, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. All the London people have been on my case. I say, yeah, don't you work for a sensationalist news, news, news print? You have to be careful about what you say. You just said 90%. So that's nine in 10 of Nigerians living abroad. I can tell you nine in 10 of Nigerians living abroad are very extremely hardworking people doing great and the stats are there to see. You know, just look at all the successful Nigerians, be it in sports, be it in entertainment, be it in public service. Doing great stuff. In this our Obodo London, no? 37th state of Nigeria. Well, the Nigeria High Commission in the UK is like the parent body for all Nigerians in the diaspora. And I think in my very first 15 years in the UK, I had no connection whatever with the High Commission. But um, in the past few, in the recent years, I've, I've found myself in a situation where I've, um, I have friends in the Nigerian High Commission, I have connects in the Nigerian High Commission. And when there are any major issues, you know, affecting Nigeria, I've had to at different times kind of like speak with a, help, a few people in there. That relationship is important. We are estimated at anything between 400,000 and a million in this town. We don't know the actual numbers, but we are many in this town and it's important to keep that relationship going. Uh, I know at times people don't like to talk about government, but then government have their own problems as well and they have their uses, and particularly in the diaspora. Um, a lot of Nigerians get into problems or issues that they need to solve, and that connect with um, that arm of government makes things work. Arriving in the UK in November, in 1991 very cold that's the first thing that hits you as somebody traveling abroad um the cold no bit no bit no bit small thing it go catch you and that was uh, perhaps in hindsight i should have arrived in the summer month so adjusting to the cold was the first thing i love my niger food 
back in 1991, Nigerian food was not readily accessible as we have today. One of the things I say today, if I want to, if I'm, say you were in Nigeria rugged and we we're going to have a competition and I was meant to cook a Nigerian meal, leaving my house and you leave your house, I will get to a Nigerian store in the UK, buy the food, go back home and cook it quicker than you living in Nigeria, in London. Trust me. Rugged Man TV International. On YouTube and Facebook. Subscribe and follow now. Also, like, share, and comment. For talk shows, Get. lifestyle, news, music, and more. Don't forget to turn on your notifications. Rugged Man TV International.